as usual, also, this will be available as a podcast on all your favorite platforms under the Lead Lag Report, Lead Lag Live banner. My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the hour is Linda Rashke, who uh, has a lot to talk about as far as her experience, how to think about trading. But Linda, for those who are not familiar with you, but maybe aware of your name, given uh, your interview with Schwager, introduce yourself as far as who are you, how'd you get involved and interested in markets, and what are you doing right now? No, I've been trading since 1981. I started off on the floor of the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. And of course, I I think I've gone over my biography numerous times, so I'm not going to elaborate too much, but I was on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange then. I had memberships on two exchanges. I then moved off the trading floor in 1986. And eventually in 92, I started trading futures. I was trading the S&Ps the very first day they were listed. So the futures markets are my best trading vehicle and continue to be. I started a a CTA back in 1993 and uh, over the years, you know, the industry is constantly morphing in terms of the type of format that the clients would prefer to to see. So, uh, you know, it went from individual accounts into funds. And eventually I started a hedge fund and was a CPO, commodity pool operator. Most of my clients for my fund were fund of funds. So that was really interesting because they'd always come around uh, twice a year for due diligence and so forth. And it was very cool hearing it from the perspective of a manager who allocates to other managers. And uh, I learned a lot through that process. I learned a lot because I had a fellow come work for me when I started my CTA, and he had originally been with Show, one of the original turtles. And so he knew how to execute size, which was important in those days than it is now. You know, everything's been an evolution. And I have to say that I, I learned so much from so many people along the way. But ultimately, you know, it still comes down to our going through our own learning experiences ourself. And so over time, that's probably where the best of my learning comes. It's not always joyous. It's usually from the painful experiences. But, you know, understanding modeling, statistics, market outliers, just the dynamics of of money flows, all sorts of different things. I had built my own office and I started going up to New York because I was missing the camaraderie from the trading floor and I had joined the Market Technicians Association. So this was back in the mid 90s, no, a little bit later. It's a cool experience because on the trading floor for 10 years, you know, I'm operating from a different type of perspective than one from true uh, technical analysis and trading and analysis are very different in a lot of ways. So then I, I started doing a lot more work with modeling, statistical modeling, you know, and so forth, and had the privilege of meeting so many greats through that organization. In the early days, it was just you know, the Ralph Akinpour and Perry Kaufman and, you know, Arch Crawford and all these people that unfortunately have also passed, not all of them, of course. So I feel like I had a helping hand up through the ropes just in terms of philosophical context. And like, let me just repeat that, you know, how the world should operate has nothing to do with how it actually operates. And uh, it was a wonderful foundation or plus that, again, really doesn't help my day, but it helps make sense of everything. You yourself said that your father worked with Bob Farrell. So he was really known for sentiment, being a father of a lot of sentiment work and market and, and psychology, you know. And so now we can start to cross over a little bit into a different part of the trading arena. So I had my hedge fund. Uh, I actually had multiple hedge funds, both offshore and onshore. And then what happened is, you know, with some of the dynamics of the moves that happened in the mid 2000s and clients not being able to take their money out of funds, there was one particular fiasco. I don't name names or anything like that with the fund up in Chicago that was supposed to have the monies parked in a sort of cash equivalent type of vehicle. And of course, it it really was not and it exploded 
economy and people lost a lot of money where they shouldn't have. So then once again, and with the advent of MF Global and Revco and all these other things, people wanted control of their accounts again. And by this, I mean the high well-capitalized institutions or players that would allocate money. So then we went back to structures of having individual accounts where if they felt like it, they could withdraw the money at any time and so forth. So I've been through a lot of changes on the trading side of the industry. When I started off, we were just trading equity options and it was like the Wild West. The puts weren't even listed, I think, until 1978. I think the calls were listed two years earlier. And so there was a huge edge in terms of arbitrage opportunities that lent it, you know, a very easy way to make money on the floor. And of course, that quickly went away after a couple of years. And I watched them bring new products on all the time from single stock futures to goodness Goodness knows, you know, you know the gamut of all the products that have been out there in the last 40, 50 years. And so, you know, and then, of course, moving to more digital mediums. You know, when I started off, stocks traded in eighths. And it's just been one big journey for me, seriously. So from the trading standpoint, I still prefer to trade futures. I trade everything under the sun, though, with the exception of crypto. I've never bothered with that space just because... I don't like the liquidity there and unfair bid ask. It's just like a whole can of worms. You don't need it. And then I've also gone through a lot of cycles with the managed products, the way it's structured. Unfortunately, the regulatory environment for me, I considered myself to be a small fish. Anything under, you know, $800 million under management for me was like a small fish. I was a small fish. $500 million is small fish these days because you start having to have a lot of different layers, you know, with the costs involved with the management and then the exchange fees went up so much, you know, and I had to have every trader I had working with me and, and our, all our risk modules, everything had to be paying a <laughs> separate fees to the exchanges. It was just, so I, I sort of took that as a sign from God. Okay. I've had a great, great, great run. Let me cash in the chips. And I did that back, in, I think 2014 or 15, right around then I, I basically retired from being a professional in the industry, as you might call that. And so now I still trade from my own account. I still am always involved in different projects. To me, it's like a little Rubik's cube with the technicals, you know, writing automated algorithms that can do things while I'm out of the office has become more of my priority now instead of, you know, being in front of the screens full time. But that's the great thing about this business is that you never arrive per se, you know, you never feel like, aha, I know everything there is to know. And in fact, you know, I know I know less than I've ever known. And, you know, so that's my journey. You know, I, I feel very strongly about the things that the market has taught me from experience the hard way, as always. I People think of me as a discretionary trader or a swing trader or a day trader, all these different labels I've been called. And, you know, if you saw a dollar bill on the sidewalk, you certainly would bend over and pick it up. So that's like little S&P scalping. I love doing that. But I also have on I have models that I trade that will hold a position for two to three days. And then I also have some things that are very long time horizon type of stuff. I don't have much of that on right now. If I did, it would still probably have a little bit of a short side bias. But, you know, the problem with a longer term time horizon is it starts to take away your flexibility to capitalize on the lovely volatility that the market has provided to us. And, you know, as an opportunistic type of trader, meaning that I'm usually waiting a lot of times for the other side to be caught off balance, that would be a mild mean reversion play, or you're waiting for something's ripe when you're going to have that 
dynamic shift in the supply demand imbalance. So it could be the start of a swing that you're just capitalizing onto the upside. It could be the middle part of the swing where you're then breaking out for the leg two. Or, you know, there's spots where you do get, especially in the morning session, there's amazing volatility that we have now pretty much for the last couple of years, you know, where so much has already unfolded in Europe and the morning, you know, off the numbers, the little liquidation flushes or short squeezes can, for me, be really a ripe source of opportunity. But those are very hard to take advantage of if you've already deployed too much capital or you're too opinionated or already have positions, you know, too big of the positions on in front of that. So that's sort of in a nutshell, my intro. All right. So learning is a big part of everything you just talked about there. Learning in this business to me is, I think, to think through in that there's a lot of noise that you have to filter through to figure out what to actually learn, right? So talk about some of the things that you've learned that were valid versus things that you learned that you realized with hindsight probably were more noise. Well, you did hit a good point. That's why this industry is always going to be, um, you know, one of the fuzzy variables. And, you know, nobody knows for sure because of that noise factor. And the lower the time frame, it's sort of a paradox because the lower the time frame you go down to, the higher the noise level in the data. And so, therefore, on a shorter time frame, mean reversion tends to be a little bit more easier to capitalize on. And then, of course, on the longer time horizon, you'll start to have the pure trend manifest itself. But you also are going to need to be mindful of your risk and your leverage that you're using. So for me, it's much easier to use higher leverage on a very short time frame. And on the longer time frames, I tend to use slightly lower leverage, but then you'll get a different type of signal poking through. And so here's the real challenge with the longer time horizons. For me, the best thing that I learned was really how to frame things off in terms of pure technicals. I'm classic technician in terms of quantifying the swings by average true range. And so Art Merrill wrote a book in the 50s that defined the swings by percentage functions. That's valid too. But just the basic structure in the price, for example, on a weekly chart now, we have in the S&P cash, we have two lower highs and two, uh, and, and we took out that last lower swing low on the weekly. So technically, that weekly is in a downtrend and, um, you know, it's just going to help determine the way we assess our risk. Now, there's no reason why if you have a downtrend, you can't be looking for bottoming formations or putting an overlay of sentiment because a lot of people are talking about the sentiment readings right now, how they have reached some bearish extremes or how much cash there is on the sidelines, I don't know, 21-year highs in the cash levels, all these types of, of things. But these are what I call secondary variables, things like seasonals, commitment of traders reports, cycle analysis, election cycle, you know, the sentiment, you know, market internal work, which would be breadth data and so forth. All of these are secondary factors. And the primary variable has to be, for me, technical, you know, in that is there structure that would support a bottom? Have we done, you know, that classic Wyckoff test, you know, or, or there springs? Have we done forming of a type of base? And this is where I think that people too often put the cart in front of the horse and want to get caught up in, in, you know, a lot of the lovely indicators and so forth that software programs offer to us, if it's relative strength, rotational work, all sorts of lovely things. But there is a solid reason why foundation and technical analysis should be primary. For example, how many people have truly studied the purpose of a point and figure chart or some of this type of work? I don't use them, but 
there's a legitimate process there in the formation of a sideways line or a base, you know, these types of things. So price, price, price always has to come first, regardless of, you know, what these secondary pieces of information are telling us, be it sentiment, commitment of traders, cash on sidelines, yada, yada, yada. Price was always going to be there to help pull you in or provide a low risk entry point if it's around a turning point, you know, or, you know, because I am not the, I, I'm not a great breakout trader. I like capturing the tops and bottoms of swings like anybody else, you know, but you still have to be mindful of the price. What is it telling us? And above all, the, the number one thing is risk. And Perry Kaufman, I respect him more than anybody else in terms of some of the quantitative work and modeling that he's done and what he's contributed to the field of technical analysis. And he does fabulous work and, you know, pullbacks on relative strength leaders or whatever the case, you know, it's like there, we, we only can do so many strategies out there, you know, but he was telling me about during the pandemic, okay, because this is a classic example of an outlier. And he was telling me that he had just finished implementing on his automated program because he's 100% automated in terms of his execution and style that he had just put in a safety net that I forget what it was when the portfolio hit down minus 8% or down minus 10%, whatever it was, that he had a bailout, you know, where you just flatten. And this is not a bad idea. You cannot do it, of course, if you're running billions of dollars, but you have to have some price threshold or some drawdown level or something that tells you that something is either not working or your strategy has experienced significant deterioration, which is something that's really not talked about a whole lot in strategies and modelings, but most all of them have some you know, half-life you know, in terms of the decay of their ability to capture an edge. And so you have to have some method to tell you that just like a trader has a stop loss, because it might be a change in the dynamics of the markets. It might be a change in, you know, so many different things, or it could just be an outlier, a random outlier event. And, and you're just hoping that if that be the case, it's not going to be a big gap where you can't get out because obviously everybody else is going to want to be trying to get out at the same time. So yeah, price, price foremost to frame everything off by price and uh, risk. So those things are lessons that I just don't think anybody appreciates, you know, and then it's just like poker. It's like your ability to stay in the game. This is really the key to the markets. The more you can stay in the game, the longer the period, just like poker, okay, the more experience you gain. And and this is really where there is a huge edge in just gaining experience. And unfortunately, it's not anything that anybody can teach you. You know, it's just... You have to be diligent in your own observations, your own study, your own modeling, your own research, your own collaboration with other colleagues. And it just takes time, unfortunately. You know, it's like a really good surgeon or, you know, all these other profession, professions, you know, a really good golfer, you know, a really good musician. It's just the accumulation of time and experience, and then the more experience and time, you learn more nuances and yada, yada, yada. So uh, it shouldn't be a discouraging talk that I'm giving. It should be a, a hopeful one because it should tell you that even if you found challenges in the past, that, you know, it, there's a whole field ahead of us in the next decade, all kinds of new wondrous things to look forward to and opportunities to capitalize on. They might come from the downside. They might come from the upside. They might come from a collapse in volatility at some point, which is usually what happens. Bottoms in bear markets, I'm not saying we're in a bull market or a bear market, but bottoms in a rising 
uptrending markets tend to be super volatile and provide a different set of signals than what we have seen typically at the bottoms in bear markets over the last 120 years. So we'll see how this one plays out. It never it never happens the same way twice. <laughs> That's the other thing I've learned the hard way. It never happens the same way twice. One of the, um, I remember when I was reading Schwager's Marker Wizards book and then the new Marker Wizards book, one of the things that struck me was that a lot of the greats tend to have, let's call it lumpy performance. So they, they really get the magnitude when it's there, less so on the frequency side of things. Do you think there's some validity to the idea that real longer term wealth generation and being a great trader comes from just a few really big trades that you happen to get right? No, I don't believe that at all. Then that just means that you got lucky and you called it right and you caught, you know, a sell off in 2009. You know, you still got to be able to make a living every year. And so I think that you have to confuse, don't confuse like the big win that comes from an event. Okay, see, there's a difference. If you captured a unique event, that's different than the uneven distribution in the, it, it, I'll just say wins, because we'll assume that we're all going to be profitable here, that comes from either a systematic type of program, such as trend following or discretionary. On the trading floor, most of the traders in, you know, this is 30, 40 years ago, would experience three to four great months. Either the market that they're trading comes to life. Most traders tend to perform better when there's good volatility. So, you know, they either had, you know, something like that. I have to be careful with the short-term systematic and mechanical things because that does not apply to these operations that can do thousands of strategies every day and thousands of transactions every day and be working the markets you know 24/7 across the globe such as the renaissance you know the medallion fund which was probably the most successful most brilliant fund in history with the smoothest equity curve to boot okay so we're not in that game you or i don't have that type of technical infrastructure and it, it's a different type of business so i don't want to go there but in general i have always felt that I, I believe in large sample sizes. So let's just take a very generic example of trend following. And I can say that any 10-year period, a basic decent trend following strategy will show a positive expectation, you know. But now I've got data going back for years and years and years, okay? So I think that's also really important that you have to have a decent sample size, and this is an interesting can of worms because Nelson Freeberg, who uh, rest in peace, passed a um, number of years ago, used to put out a wonderful letter called Formula Research. I mean, Tudor Jones subscribed to it, you know, Ned Davis, all the big guys subscribed to it. It was really great work. And Nelson would take these models that had been put out there in the public domain and you know, honestly, back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I think people were less reticent to share their work. Nowadays, you know, people tend to be a little bit more guarded about it, probably rightfully so. But Nelson would take some basic models, and his was more of a longer term orientation, could involve a little bit of asset allocation type of stuff, it could use T bills as a proxy in one of the variables, you know, for cash, all these different types of things. And I said to him, Nelson, how can you have confidence that these models are going to be durable and robust, two very important words for me, when you have a sample size of only 12 or only 16 over the last hundred years, you know, how I, 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 I always feel like I would be comparing apples to oranges. And, you know, Nelson's a very thoughtful person was, and would scratch his head and say, well, there's another component here. And that is common sense. So if I have a model that might have a sample size of only 12, which for me is a very, very low confidence factor, but there's also this the whole thing makes sense. You know, he would sort of give that brownie points <laughs> if that makes sense, you know. And so then he would, you know, feel more comfortable adopting that model. So 
I don't think that, I guess those are two very important words. You know, is your method or strategy or approach to the market going to remain durable and robust? In other words, you haven't curve fitted it so many times that it's not practical going forward or it it will maintain some type of edge statistically. It it might not be a huge edge, but it's still going to hold up in the future. And so for me, the types of modeling that I've done that, you know, everything has to be durable and robust. Most of the work tends to have no more than two variables and one filter. Okay. Now these are very simplistic models, but all the work that I did in the eighties and the nineties and to two thousands, I still rely on today. So even though, you know, especially looking at weekly data where you might get a trend reversal technically on weekly charts once every 12 years, say, for example, but that, of course, could be clustered. You know, maybe we had more trend reversals on pure technical price chart basis in the 70s. And then obviously what we've been experiencing for the last 10 years was extremely artificial, just extreme, last 12 years really, extremely artificial. And that's sort of the aberration to me. That is the one-off, you know, that we are probably never going to see again in our lifetime where just to give you a statistic that's pretty good about perspective here. If I were to look at monetary bases and and money supply and and these types of things, and I just took the, the monetary base in the U.S., we have to adjust or normalize this for the population. You know, of course, the population has doubled since 1956, literally. There's twice as many people on this earth than when I was born. So we have to normalize these types of things. If we normalize the cash per person that was there in 2011, it was $4,100 cash per person. And if we looked at cash per person in 2022, at the beginning of the year, it was $8,600. So it went up more than 100%. This is not an even distribution or anything. This is just to illustrate an example of the explosion in the monetary base. And I'm sure everybody's talked about this and knows about this, but that was an aberration for a multitude of reasons. And I don't think we'll ever see that type of environment again. And so now we're just like a little, you know, having a little hangover here, trying to figure out how to digest all that, you know, and everybody's making this big deal about the 30 year yields and so forth. But, you know, we survived just fine from 2000 to 2008, forget about the over leveraging with the derivatives and so forth and the bad banking practices that led to an implosion in some of the, you know, the real estate markets. But, you know, the average 30 year rate back in and for a 10 year period fluctuated around four and a half percent. And we did just fine, you know, so I think that could be where we're trying to adjust to. And the Fed really got under pressure. I don't like trying to interpret who does what, why, where, how, you know, in terms of the Fed speak. But obviously, they're they're trying to get back to a more normal level, given the, you know, the previous 40 years. And uh, it's, you know, people forget <laughs> how glorious the previous decade was. And and a lot of that was very artificial. So I I don't know. I'm also subscribed to George Thoros' theory, which is not really his theory, but he popularized it of reflexivity, where the market tends to overshoot in its attempt to find an equilibrium point. So obviously, we overshot to the upside, you know, with the insane PE ratios and everything that we had. And it might be that eventually, and I don't know how long this process is going to take, it might be eventually that we see an overshoot to the downside before the market then readjusts and comes back to some type of equilibrium point. But now I've digressed into a philosophical 
type of, you know, venting. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> we can go on and spout out different theories and, and so forth, but, you know, we'll just have to see how it plays out one data point at a time. No, and, and I think it's important because the I always make it a point that people talk in terms of endpoint, but they react off of path, right? And the path behavior is all you really care about as a trader. And I love that you mentioned that you only focus on I think you said one or two major things and you, you know, keep on relying on those throughout history and time. Do you find that traders often overcomplicate things? They want to look at too many variables, too many signals. Because I often believe myself that the most robust strategies are the ones that you, where you find maybe a signal or, or some approach that explains maybe 50, 60 percent of why markets do what they do and accept the reality that the rest is probably randomness. Well, it's. I I ha I don't like speaking in generalizations because traders may just be who you hang with, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, um, most professional traders will tend to specialize in one thing. They've arrived at something that works for them. They all have an excellent sense of risk management. That's why they're professional traders, because they have been able to ride out that learning curve and gain experience and they know themselves. So traders who make their living by their own means, meaning their own bottom line, might be a different population group than traders who are CTAs, fund managers that also have a management fee that helps them ride out some of the uh, larger standard deviation in their bottom line. Okay, so that's, I don't really see what traders per se are doing other than, you know, me making a little joke on Twitter about indicators or just, you know, hearing from a friend or something. I'm, I'm not in the education space. I did put out a ton of videos out there for free just in, it was a period in my history where I was sharing some of my work with, you know, the International Federation of Technical Analysis and this and that. And I just got on a little roll there. Sometimes when you're forced to make a presentation, they all always say that the teacher learns more than the student. So it was in part my way of always doing self-education or self-learning. Think that there's two hindrances to a classic retail trader, you know, having a sustainable uh, career in this business. And the first is the, the same variable that you would find with any performance-oriented discipline, be it practicing an instrument or, or playing a sport or anything along those lines. You must learn how to tune out all the distractions. And, you know, for the people that are under age, I don't know, I don't even know, age 35, I do think they have some other gene in their head, you know, <laughs> the way they can type on their little apps and phones so quickly. But you must learn how to concentrate and to focus. Even if you are 100% systematic, it still takes a lot of concentration to visualize what you are trying to accomplish with your coding or your routines and not get caught up in what other people are doing, what somebody says on the TV, what somebody says on, you know, Twitter or some, you know, digital medium. You have to learn to think for yourself. That is a trader. A trader is one who's doing their own work and they know when they're going to go against the crowd, per se, and when it's not a good idea to go against the crowd. You know, they have to be able to see and feel it for themselves because only then do they know when they got that tiger by the tail or got it right. And then that's where it's really important to increase the leverage. You see, so a lot of times professional traders are always Dinking, dinking, testing, testing, you know, not too soon, nope, not right, da 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 da. But when they do catch that tide going in or that tide just starting to go out and and there's this swoosh in the change in the in the supply demand, it's really important to be right on top of that and place bigger bets. And then that's really where your profits are going to come from. And that could easily come from a, a large fund as well. Large funds do that. You know, they're kind of dinking around, dinking around, and then they find where, you know, 
they're going to make their bet or their play. You know, George Soros used to do this watching Stanley Druckenmiller and the people underneath him and so forth. He, he would follow the five traders underneath him at the time. So rumor has it because I wasn't there personally, but I do know friends that do know Soros and the way he used to operate. And so he would kind of see what everybody was doing that was trading underneath them. And then if he liked one of their bets or their thinking, then he would jump on and do it in bigger size, you see. So everybody, you know, arrives at a different way of operating for sure. But there's some you know, principles that are really important, tuning out the noise and the distractions and other people's opinions. And I'm the first to admit that I'll get influenced. I have two or three friends on Skype. We mostly tell jokes or yak. You know, fortunately, they trade different things than I do. But I have to be really careful not to have them pull me away from my game plan. So that's the first problem, you know, when you're starting out with the trading. And the second problem is that people far underestimate the learning curve. And it's really all about surviving the learning curve. And I always jokingly tell people that it takes a minimum of three years, full time, full time you know, before you start to truly get your feet wet and understand what's going on. But in truth, it's really more like eight to 10 years, okay? It really takes at least eight to 10 years before you have arrived at your way of organizing structure, organizing data, you know, where are the little nuances and plays that you can pull off best, That's always a good way to look at something. You know, I like these people out there that frame things out in terms of a playbook, because now what you've done is you have taken away the ego of this big, like, oh, let me call the the next uptrend or let me call the next downtrend, you know, and by categorizing it into a a little playbook or little short term strategies you also give yourself plenty of time to be out of the market, which is really important to gain perspective again, okay? You cannot see clearly when you have positions on. And so it's a little bit of a double-edged sword there, but you need time out to sort of regroup, let go of the things that were not working, which is very difficult if you're newer to the game because you kind of get in a habit of, okay, I'm only trading from the long side, I'm only trading the long side, and this is working, and this is working, and then bam, you know, everything reverses. And what are you doing? You're always looking for the buy opportunities, but yet the whole, it's been a regime change, okay? So it's very difficult to adjust to these regime changes if you have less than 10 years experience. And I'm just speaking in generalizations. I do recognize that people, you know, can do do very well with much lesser time. It's also going to come down to the amount of hours that you put in study. So as is the case with, again, anything that's a performance-oriented discipline where you're being judged by your bottom line or whatever, the more hours and the more you immerse yourself in it and make it a priority, um, probably you'll be able to speed up that learning curve just a little bit. So, you know, but, but, You better love what you do. You better love the challenge. You better love studying yourself and everything that comes at you that might force you to take a step backward or reevaluate, you know, your models of operation. You have to welcome that and say, ah, I'm going to take that information that the market gave me. I'm going to take that feedback, be it in the form of a loss or whatever, and I'm going to use that now to get even better and smarter, you see? So if you can approach the business with that type of attitude, I think then you have a better chance of succeeding. You had mentioned to me that you're a big fan of behavior finance and psychology, Linda. And by the way, everybody here, please make sure you follow Linda Rashke here on Twitter. And of course, check out her interviews on various podcasts. And of course, with Jack Schwager's New Market Wizards. But in terms of some of the behavioral biases that you think people get most into trouble with, what are some of the the main ones that you think are really critical? So to me, uh, the biggest <laughs> biggest bias I tend to see, certainly on FinTwit, is recency bias. Right? Everybody's extrapolating the very small sample and assuming it continues forever. But what are some of the things that behaviorally you think get people into trouble? 
Well, you know, you can Google, you know, cognitive biases and you'll see a list of about 40 main biases. And then there's really about 20 ones that I think are more prevalent among traders. Certainly recency biases was one of the first ones to really be explored that people will be influenced by the last bar. So if you have a daily candlestick and it closes low to high, they will be more prone to say the next bar is going to be up. So that will be a very common recency bias example. You know, there's that that's that's a good one. There's so many, you know, I, I just uh, there's the <laughs> there's the other recency, there's the other cognitive bias. Oh, but it doesn't apply to me, right? <laughs> Have you ever had that one? Oh, yeah, I've read all about that. I know about all these main cognitive biases, but but they don't apply to me. So, you know, stick your head in the sand. That's also a form of, you know, some type of bias. You know, if I don't see it, then it doesn't exist, you know. But I think one of the best tools that is useful for both fund managers and traders are simply statistical tools that keep you accountable, you know, writing down your daily balance or, you know, writing down the things that are working that are successful. All these types of things are, um, I think it, it's very easy business to not be accountable in the same way that we need to be. Okay. We can pass it off. Oh, it's just a a long term, you know, cycle that extended further than it should have, you know, or, oh, well, you know, I, I just didn't have a good day yesterday because I, I overslept and, you know, was out too late the night before. These, you know, people make excuses. And so if you have something hard and fast that's statistics and you're having to tell statistics, your, your excuses to that piece of paper every day you'll start to feel kind of sheepish or dumb after a while for, well, okay, you know, I'm not really happy with this. I'm always the one that's accountable. So accountability, you know, if, I wrote this book, Trading Sardines. It's kind of funny because it's like, you know, just these random outliers where I'm getting whacked left and right, you know, and of course, you know, it, I had a fund at the time. And of course, it's not like they were my fault. And it's not like I could see these things coming either, be it a, 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 a gross execution error that I wasn't aware of at the time that one of my employees made or a tsunami that hit anything. But you still are accountable. You still are the captain steering the ship. And uh, I think that that's really important to to understand how important it is just to be 100% accountable and you know you know after a while you'll get tired of of saying oops i made a mistake oops i made a mistake oops i made a mistake and then you'll say damn it i don't want that mistake to happen again you know what am i going to do to prevent that mistake from happening again and i like to call things like bad trades, you know, errors <laughs> or mistakes, because it's much easier to say, oh, I just need to fix it. I just need to correct that mistake. You know, whereas if it's, if you say, oh, it's a bad trade, you know, you don't want to say, oh, that was a, not a good idea. I didn't really think that through. I didn't really do the research that I could have. I didn't really define my risk as well as I could have before putting on that trade, you see. So if you can just say, look, that was just a boner. It was part of the learning process. I'm sorry I did it. You know, I, I'm going to find the ways to prevent that from happening again in the future. Now you have constructive learning curve, and that's what the market is all about. You know, it's people think that, you know, you should be smart or you should know or you should figure things out. And, and that's just not the way that it works. We want to think that we can figure things out, but it's more a constant, constructive, and you have to say that word in front of it, constructive, because sometimes we have some ugly months or little boo-boos on our bottom line, but you still have to say, that was really constructive because I learned from that. I had a you know an 8% drawdown off of the month there. I'm going to make sure that in the future, if it hits a 6% drawdown, that market is telling me or my bottom line is telling me something and I'm going to become the best risk manager around, you know, that type of thing. So it's, you know, how you frame it out in your mind. 
You mentioned, Linda, that you started your career in 1981, which is when Volcker started raising rates. And you talked about how there's you know, always an evolution and a learning process when it comes to trading. I'm just curious with with hindsight, is there anything different about trading today versus 81 when you started? I mean, aside from some of the parallels that people make the argument of with inflation and Fed policy to that period, um, how do you think about trading now versus back then? Trading and the tools that we have and the markets that we have and the drivers. So everything usually has a driver if you're looking out on a longer time horizon. They change every five years. You know, they every three years, every two years, you know, I know that, you know, whatever I come up with, there's going to be changes. I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and no, you can't see them happening. Okay. That's the whole point. It's a slow, insidious type of regime change. It's not like they ring the bell. Of course, they kind of did at the beginning of this year, you know, but <laughs> with a lot of variables, you know, the Fed's blatant policy and a little bit of global uh, in, you know, instability and so forth. But normally they don't ring that bell and say, okay, you know, time to do regime change and look the other way. So I, I, I was going to give you an example. I have, I had some of the best models in the bond market, just fabulous, fabulous models. And these were for trades that were in duration of two to three days. So I'm not calling anything too far out. It's more along the lines of a Larry Williams type of style. You know, you, you, you put the trade on and, you know, look to take it off on the close two days later or the open two days later or trail a stop or play for a fixed target type of thing. So they're just really nice little bread and butter trades. A lot of VAs like Toby Craybell type, you know, originally, you know, did very well with this type of time horizon. And uh, so I had some beautiful, beautiful bond models and, uh, you know, I couldn't, after I'd had about four losers in a row and I had, you know, I had two colleagues that worked for me and they're very smart and, you know, we're all watching the same thing. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd put on the trade and it would just get crushed over the next two days or stopped out type of thing. And it took me about a couple months of getting my head repeatedly like bonked there. Something is not working. All my models have totally broken down in this freaking bond market here, you know, and, you know, and it was, they were more along the lines of looking for a little retest type of pattern, but you know, the type that should normally have an 80% win rate. And now the win rates running around 15%. And of course it was due to, you know, change in, Fed policies and monetary environment. And that's when we basically, you know, exploded that monetary base. And it was it was on a global wide basis the last decade. You know, it wasn't just the U.S. Everybody likes to point fingers at the U.S., but it was just an insane explosion in money supply. And so it changed a lot of, of little patterns that traders would keep their eyes open for. And I, I believe, um, I don't know, because I, I didn't read them or wasn't privy to them, but, you know, zero hedge type of blogs and so forth. Everybody was publishing a list of when the Fed would come in for the QE days and so forth. And there was such a reliable edge there. You know, <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, OK, we're going to buy. All right, let's just get along today and exit on the close of the day type of thing. It was just amazing. I mean, in canny, you know, and, and it's like everything. OK, you know, once you figure it out, then they change the lock. Right. You find the key. They change the lock. Now it, now you move on. Now there's other things. Are we having strong closes or weak closes in the last hour? Are we having strong closes or weak closes on a Friday? So now all these go back into a different type of nuanced observation. And we're back to what I said, you can be aware of the observation or the tendency, but you still need to frame things out price wise. Where's your risk? You know, what's the holding period, all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. And, and maybe for the for the last question here, again, everybody, please make sure you follow Linda here on Twitter. But you'd, I want to go back to a term you used before. You said good volatility, that traders want to see good volatility. I, I'm curious how you define what good volatility is. And, and the reason I'm going with that is I'd argue that we're in a really nasty volatility feedback loop because the bond market is now driving the real risk, 
right? Especially with the speed with which long duration treasuries have collapsed. I keep making this argument that if that continues with the amount of debt in the system, that's, you know, you can argue that's a cataclysmic type of scenario and you can't really win in that kind of scenario. So if that bad volatility persists, we're all in a lot of trouble, but if it at least cools down, then you might have good volatility that might favor traders, at least on the long side for equities. D- define what good and bad volatility is and where are we today? Well, first of all, you're making a lot of assumptions there that the market is not going to be able to adjust s- to certain variables. I mean, certainly we can overshoot or under overshoot and so forth. You know, if you pull out, you know, 50 year charts of the 10 year yields, you know, and try to put it in a, on a monthly basis and put it in perspective, quite honestly, it doesn't look anything totally insane to me. It's just that, you know, you always have a case where markets go down faster than they go up. That's sort of the way it works. And part of that, you know, everybody's trying to get out the door at once. Everybody got over leveraged, you know, just a lot of stupid stupid policies that led to people's short-sightedness. But I challenge you to put up a 30-year monthly chart and go back to like, I don't know, just look back 50 years. And it's, I mean, it's sort of obvious the downtrend was broken. Nobody would disagree with that. And I personally think that like, you know, if we go back on the 30-year data and look at, well, where did it trade and fluctuate a lot. Okay, so this is sort of for those of you who are familiar with market profile work, you can take the market profile concepts which a lot of people apply on a daily basis, but you can also apply those same market market profile concepts on weekly data, monthly data and so forth. And so the market profile concepts are just they're really different semantics is all it comes down to, but you know, where would a natural home be for these rates to go to? So if I look at a monthly chart of the 30 years, I mean, the first thing that steps out to me is that we really fluctuated around that 3% level for about eight years. You know, if I, I don't know, I'm just kind of making this up off the top of my head there, but I think it was about 2010 to maybe 2017 or something. You know, we were really plus or minus around 3% there for quite a few years. So that was sort of the equilibrium level that it had arrived at. And then it had that ridiculous, goofy, you know, spike down to nothingness, which was the aberration, which was caused obviously by, you know, fearful things about the pandemic and COVID and a lot of overreactions. Okay. So that was the aberration to the downside up to, up to that point, we had really been rotating around 3%, which wasn't such a big deal. And if I go back and I look at the 30 year charts, well, it just sort of looks like the next level that we should go and fluctuate around would be 4.5%. And like I said, you know, the economy did just fine, you know, 2000 to 2008 before there was a little bit of abuse there with the derivatives and stuff. I don't see why we can't just go back to 4.5%. And, you know, it's, there's always a purpose behind this, okay? It may not be an easy adjustment, okay? It may be painful for some people. It may benefit others. Obviously, you know, banks and insurance companies and some financial institutions welcome the higher rates. You know, individuals that have been sitting there in cash and sucking down nothing on T-bills, we welcome the higher rates. You know, I can get like 4.3% now on a 26-week T-bill, you know, at auction. So we welcome those types of things. But here's what the real message is. It's got nothing to do, in my opinion, and this is just speaking from my opinion, and now I'm not wearing my trader hat, nor am I wearing my technician's hat, but in my opinion, it's it's never easy. It's always painful going through an adjustment in life cycles and changes. So it has nothing to do with the supply issue that, oh, we can't produce enough oil, oh, we can't. I mean, the supply chain stuff's been really resolved and rectified, and China's basically been moving all their factories to south of Mexico, you know, south of the U.S. border there down in Mexico. I mean, it drives certain things, you know. But the problem is this demand component. 
And you have so many people living well beyond their means. I mean, during that pandemic, everybody's sitting at home and Amazon sales exploded 25%. Is there any reason why people need so much crap? Is there any reason why spending over a two-year period should go up 25% other than that people are bored and they're addicted to their little dopamine rushes every time they click on an app? No, I mean, it's not. And we can't continue the way that we have been, seriously, because <laughs> I'm a big proponent of, I don't want to get into like heavy duty nonsense stuff, you know, this organization of Rome that wrote these papers since 1972 on the limits to growth. Okay. But, you know, unfortunately, there are limits to growth. It's called resources, pollution, population growth, you know, sustainability issues. And we're, we're starting to butt up against that, you know, and so the biggest thing in my, this is not as a trader again, not as a technician, but a humanitarian is that we start, we need to be mindful of our resources and the gross overconsumption that the U S does. You know, it was really interesting because I went to Italy over the summer to the Amalfi coast, which meant that we flew into Naples from Rome. And so when I was flying back from Naples to Rome, you had to walk through this really long corridor to get over to the other section of the airport. And on the walls, they had painted in big, bold letters and really pretty, pretty, pretty murals, you know, be mindful of your consumption. Please don't consume so much. We have our children and our earth to think about over the next, you know, 20 years. It was such a strong message. Ironically, it dumped you right off into the tariff-free shopping for all the grossly, you know, <laughs> luxury goods, which I thought was a little bit funny. But you, you get my point. You would never see that in the U.S. You would never see that oh gosh, we need to start being mindful of our consumption. And, you know, I bet you everybody out there, if you looked at all the things that you have purchased, if it's like $5 items off Amazon or big expenditures, you know, over the last four or five months, I mean, I put in hurricane windows on my house, I put in a new roof, I put in new AC, I mean, a lot of big expenditures and stuff. But, you know, some at some point you have to ask yourself, how much was really, truly necessary? And I bet you that everybody could have gotten by on just 10% of the expenditures that they have made this year. And a lot of it is, is crap. And sort of that's what you have people in the lower echelon dealing with now, you know, their insurance premiums, you know, the, you know, their transportation, their food, all these types of things. I mean, those are necessary expenditures for them. So they don't really have a whole lot left over. So it's really got to come from the people that are better off and think that they're above not having to curtail demand. And so the market's going to find a way, you know, the market's I think, and dollars are the most powerful correctors of people's habits, okay, which is impossible to, to correct. It's so hard, addictions, all these types of things. It's a can of worms, and I'm certainly not going to go there today, you know, but the, the main thing that's going to change people's habits are price, you know, and, and these types of of funny things. So, you know, it just feels to me like that's a little bit too of a, a, a way of framing it out as being maybe uncomfortable and painful, but maybe it's the only road going forward, you know, for the next 20, 30 years, if you have grandchildren as I do now. So sorry to, sorry to plop that. No, no, I'll tell you what, and that's, that's actually you. Good, <laughs> no, no. And that, that's a good way to, I think, to end, end the space too, because the, I shared it at the top, Linda, I think you and I think similarly in that, yeah, you know, I put this tweet out on unpopular opinion, buy more you shit and you won't suffer supply chain disruptions. I mean, the waste is part of the problem and you're kind of alluding to that. That's, and, and I think we should do another follow-up space, hopefully at some point, because I'll, I'll challenge you on the question of yields only because I think if you only look at yields relative to history without factoring in the total leverage there is at those moments in time, it, I think it gives a false sense of how precarious the environment, I think personally, that we're in when you've got $300 trillion of government debt and government debt's acting as volatile as it is. But we can say that for- It's not, you know what, it's it's not the US. It's it's the whole global it's everyone. financial yep. system. Yep. And you know who actually is- 
the biggest offender of this, you know, in terms of these debt ratios to GDP and all that kind of nonsense is China. Yep. You know, they're like twice as bad as the U.S. So there is a very insidious stress in the financial system that has not played out yet. And it can, and it's not all, it's not going to be pretty when it does, but adjustments aren't. And if you look at this theory, like it was put out there, maybe, I don't know, like 50 years ago, catastrophe theory. Okay. Everybody likes to talk about chaos theory and this and that catastrophe theory is more where there's a cluster of variables and the market has to make a jump to a new space up or new space down. And it usually comes in the form of a dislocation that is is more along the nature of a gap. There's not the liquidity to the upside or the downside when you have these types of dislocations. And that is a principle of system dynamics. It's not just with markets. You know, it could be with weather patterns. It could be this whole field of system dynamics. That could be another topic for sure. But yeah, I mean, we'll probably do that. But is there any way not to do that? Everybody's hoping that there will be a soft landing. And, and just as an aside, my daughter and her husband and kid got back from the Ukraine because he's Ukrainian and, oh no, excuse me, Poland, excuse me, Poland. And, you know, they said that the restaurants were full, the, the wealthy have more money than ever, the, the, you know, the, the bars were happening. I, I live in South Florida. I don't see any cutback at all here. I mean, people might grumble a little bit that the price of avocados are higher and so forth. Everybody certainly knows there's been inflation, but you know, it's, it, you know, it, there's, there's no doubt that there's a day of reckoning coming, but, you know, on the other hand, it, you know, you, you're, you're in the process of correcting some type of insane excesses that we've had on a historical level. And no matter how you slice or dice it, it is not going to be pretty. So period. Just yeah, that, no, that's why mind your own risk. You know, there is a place and time to, you know, watch your own spending and your own budgets and so forth. And, you know, like just like as if you're going to weather a storm. OK, here's the hurricane warning. Don't do stupid things. You know, make sure you got water and so forth. And, you know, and family and friends, maybe it'll start to force a little bit change in values to appreciate the things in life that perhaps have been neglected, you know? So I, I agree. I mean, I'm not disputing the fact that there's, there's not liquidity right now and that's not going to change. But if you look at the long-term graphs of the money supply and, you know, on a global basis and all the metrics that you could see on the Fred site, we've just corrected the teeny tiniest blip so far. So I don't, I don't know where, where it's going to end. Yeah. I don't think anybody, anybody does, but it's, it's going to be a uh, challenging, I think no matter what, this was a phenomenal conversation. Need to wrap up here. Everyone again, please make sure you follow Linda who was kind enough to spend over an hour with us. Linda, real pleasure speaking with you. I, I find myself nodding to a lot of the things that you're saying. So I'm glad you imparted your experience and knowledge to the audience. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Linda. Really appreciate it. 